read a scripture, uh, Luke 4.20, out of the New American Standard, and Rick has it on the board. And it says, and he closed the book, and he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. Now, what does that mean? If you just have that one scripture, that really doesn't, it doesn't even tell you who he is if you just read that one scripture. You've got to have the background. And see, I'm going to do what he did. I'm going to sit down. So see, I have scriptural reason to sit here and to talk to you. Uh, what, what this is talking about, if you go, if you, if you look at all of Luke 4, it starts out, Jesus is in the wilderness and he's tempted by the devil for 40 days. And when he passed every test, then it's, it goes on to say that he's, he's filled with the spirit the Spirit of God is upon him, and he comes back to his own hometown, and he goes to the synagogue, which on the Sabbath they would, they would gather, and they would open up a scripture, and they would read it, and he read from Isaiah. And when he got through reading, then he sat down, and he began to share with them. Well, this was a Jewish custom. And... Linda and I went to uh, Israel three different times, and I think it was probably the last time we finally went to the ruins of, a, of an old Jewish synagogue, and they had a, a stone seat, and it was called the Seat of Moses. And whoever was speaking that day in the synagogue would sit in that seat. And that really was like saying he had the authority of Moses to speak. And he would sit in that seat, and he would speak. Well, I am uh, not sitting in the seat of Moses, but uh, I'm sitting here tonight because I don't have a sermon to bring. I don't even really have a message to bring, but I, I just want to sit here and talk with you. And some people start off with a prayer. Some people start off with a scripture. Some people even start off with a little funny joke or something. Well, we started off with a prayer, and I read you a scripture, and it showed you why I'm sitting, you know, but I really, really just wanted to be informal, but I hadn't said anything funny yet, right? Well, I made up this joke, but I didn't make it up just for tonight. I made it up on one of those trips when we went to Israel. It came to me, as they say. And now, if you've, if you've heard it, because I've, I've told it here before, but if you've heard it, just bear with me. This is uh, for the people that haven't and wherever that goes. Uh, how do you hide a camel in the desert? You use camouflage. So, all right, thank you. I appreciate that laughter. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pay you all later. Uh, so there, there you go. You got, your, you got your three standard openings. You got prayer, you got a scripture, and you got a joke. But anyway... Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about a, a subject that you may not hear talked about too much, but I want to talk to you about a, a television program. Now, the name of this program was The Six Million Dollar Man. Now, this was back in, what, the 60s or the 70s? Or, uh, all right, some of you are telling on yourself. You're telling your age. But uh, anyway... The Six Million Dollar Man, Lee Majors played in it. He was an Air Force pilot, and he got in this crash. And so they said, 
we can rebuild him. We can make him better. So they replaced all of his broken human parts with bionic parts. It cost $6 million to fix this broken man. Originally, God used dust. See, God has a different economy than us. For asphalt, he uses gold. But yet, man is constantly trying to make himself better. Even in his spiritual life, I've got to make myself better. Well, then the writers, you know, they said they uh, couldn't have this bionic man to be alone, so they created the bionic woman. Well, uh, does that sound familiar? You think you might know where that came from? But anyway, they never did really hook up. I think some episodes they were like on the same show, but, you know, they... Anyway, the mindset in this whole thing that I'm trying to get across to you is that man thinks he can improve his situation, pull himself up by the bootstraps. I can do it. I can make myself better if I just try harder, if I just do more, if I stop this, if I stop that. I'll, I'll please God. I'll please myself. I'll please people around me. That's just the mindset. But you know, that wasn't an original idea with man. That idea goes all the way back to the garden when the, when the serpent slid up there and he told Adam and Eve, he says, uh, you know, if, if, if you listen to me, you can, you can be better. Now, he didn't say it in those words, but in, uh, in Genesis 3, 5, it says, uh, Rick, go ahead and put that on there, Genesis 3, 5. For God knows in the day that you eat from it, and it's talking about the, the fruit, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, you'll be better. You'll be like God. You won't just be a human. You'll be better. But you know, the devil, before the garden, was Lucifer in heaven. He was an archangel. And he wanted to be like God. He wanted to be worshipped in the place of God. So uh, that's where the original idea came. You can be better. I can be better. He was, he was perfect when he was created, but he wanted to be better. I'm a perfectionist. I'd sure like to be better. <laughs> the only way a perfectionist can be better is to get over it. That's the only way you can be better, is to get over it. Is that right, Rick? <laughs> They've got uh, a new show out. Uh, let me just say, with, with the bionic man, the $6 million man, and the bionic woman, it seemed like all of the uh, emphasis was making them better physically, you know. Uh, they could do more, they could run faster, they could, even back with Superman, you know, he was faster than a spinning bullet and all that, but uh, it all had to do with the physical, but uh, they have a, a show that uh, has just recently come on TV called Intelligence. And so just the name of it, you know, just the name of it, Intelligence, that seems to be our focus now. You know, Daniel said in the last days, knowledge would increase. I mean, you can do everything in the world on yourself. Well, you can, not me. I'm, uh, I'm technologically challenged. But uh, I grew up in the days of uh, black and white TV in the 50s. And it had this funny little thing on it called a, a, a knob. <laughs> 
They don't even have knobs. Now, you can't find them. I tried to cut off something at home the other day. I said, where? I, could, I didn't have the remote. And I'm looking to try to, try, try to turn Mama's TV off because it didn't turn it off the first time, you know. And so went back to the remote and finally got it turned off. But everything, you know, you can... Uh, You can come up with an idea for a book, and before you get the book printed and on the market, all of, all of the uh, information is obsolete. So it, it, uh, we're seeing Daniel fulfilled. We definitely see people going to and fro, you know. He said in the last days, you know, people be going to and fro. One day I passed myself on the way to work, you know, but uh, <laughs> no, anyway. Anyway, and, and, and knowledge, knowledge just, just so, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's such a demand for it. But uh, this show intelligence, it's, a, it's about a, now, now I'm not, I'm not uh, promoting the show or I'm not, you know, I'm just giving you a report on, on what I saw. And uh, it's about this war hero and, uh, he has a, a chip implanted into his brain. And so now he doesn't have to pick up and dial the phone. I mean, he just thinks it. And he's hooked up to the Internet. He's hooked up to the phones. And uh, he can check records from, uh, he can be in Washington and check the, the records that they have in a computer on the West Coast. You know, he, I mean, it's just super everything, you know. And so... Uh, the thing that struck me about this was, you know, I, I watched it and it, uh, thoughts are going through my mind. Well, it's almost like it's, and I'm not saying this is what the writers intend. I'm just telling you this is, this is how I started perceiving things, you know. You see something on TV and all of a sudden, well, uh, just anybody couldn't get this chip. You had to have a certain DNA and all that. You had to be a, sp a special person and all that. And this guy was qualified, and he got the chip. So then you get to thinking, well, what's so bad about having a chip? Look at the advantage. You can't lose your phone because it's right here in your mind. You can't. Uh, you don't have to charge the batteries on your uh, on your computer. Everything's right there. Your the the energy from your brain, you know, charges it and all that. It take you know it takes care of it and all. And so uh, I'm thinking again about the last days, about a man that's going to come on the scene and say, well, you can't buy and sell unless you have a mark. And, well, you know, what kind of mark is it going to be? Well, I believe it's going to be some kind of chip, you know, implanted in you. Well, let's just make a TV show and get people used to seeing people with chips, you know. And, uh, you know. It was, it was in his brain, and, and the word says it'll be, you know, either on your forehead or on your right hand. So I'm, I'm not saying anything. I'm just telling you, you know, how I see things sometimes. <laughs> so I was amazed the last time I watched it because uh, they decided uh, this, the scientist that made his chip, you know, he was, he was getting older, and they... They kind of went ahead and retired him. So he made another chip, but with a little more advancement to the chip, you know. It could do things faster, and, and uh, the reasoning ability was a little better. So uh, the Chinese decided, you know, they somehow they found out about the chip, and they, they found this girl. It wasn't the Chinese government, but it was some rogue agents, and they, they found out that... Uh, they found this girl that had that same gene where she could accept the chip. So they uh, they kidnapped the scientist and forced him to implant the chip in her. And he says, "Well, I haven't completed the chip. I don't know if you know she'll even wake up." So they said, "Well, you just you just put it in her, you know." And so she didn't wake up at first, you know, and then uh, eventually her eyes popped open. Well. Now you got this man with a chip and a woman with a chip. So uh, is this good preaching? <laughs> I'm not preaching. I'm just you know we're just we're just we're just communicating. <laughs> but 
So the woman, of course, she's got a darker side to her, you know, as, as far as her thinking and all. And uh, she, I think they want to use the chip for evil, you know, according, according to this, uh, th this program, you know. So uh, she gets inside of his mind. She can, you know, she can tell what's going on inside of his mind and all that. And so she shows up one day, and they're in the same room, you know. And uh, she says, now th this, this amazed me, but she says, she told a guy, she says, well, in your Christian Bible, doesn't it say that it's not good for man to be alone? Hey, the word's getting out on secular TV. <laughs> They're quoting the Bible. <laughs> but, I mean, now you can't, you know, there's some pretty, pretty rough movies that'll have, you know, scriptures in it. So, I'm, I'm, like I say, I'm not, I'm not endorsing this. I'm just, I'm just telling you. Uh, and, it, and then she told him, she says, well, uh, you and I are, are like a, a new species, you know. It's almost like, well, we're, we're Adam and Eve, and he looks at her. I, it, it said this. She says, you know, we're like Adam and Eve. And uh, he says, uh, well, you're not Eve, but I, I think you're the serpent. So, I mean, you know, they're, they're preaching, you know, right there on the, anyway. Anyway, uh, God can speak to you in, a, in all kinds of situations, you know, just sitting here talking. You know, I could be preaching a message that I've prepared for hours, or I can say something, and I've had it happen. I've been at work and just talking with a guy, and, you know, the guy talking about something, and I'm, I'm getting under conviction what he's saying, and he doesn't even know, you know, what, he's just talking, you know. He's not talking about me, and he's not talking about something I'm doing. He's talking about basketball and, and how he loves basketball and, 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 and you know, the Lord is saying, well, you know, if you put anything before me, you know, so. Uh, so anyway, uh, I don't, we may not, uh, we may not copy this CD, but <laughs> anyway, we're, we're, we're talking. Uh, or I'm doing all the talking, I guess, but, uh, you know, Jesus didn't come and die for our sins to make us better. He came and died for our sins to make us a new man. In order, in order for this to happen, in order for us to be a new man, the old man has to die. Not physically, but spiritually. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. The key to obedience is found in the middle of the word obedience. If you write out the word obedience, and I, I should have just made a chart where you could see it, but you can write it down or you can just do it in your mind. Uh, if you spell out the word obedience, O-B-E-D, no, I'm sorry, O-B-E is the first three letters. Uh, uh, N-C-E is the last three, but right in the middle of that is D-I-E, die. That's the secret to obedience. We have to die. We have to die to our will. We have to die to our own desires. You know, Jesus doesn't want us to get better. Jesus wants us to surrender. And it's not what we can do for God, but what God has done for us and he want, what he wants to do through us. In other words, Jesus wants to live his life through us. That's the key. It's not us getting better. It's not us doing better. It's us yielding and allowing Jesus to live his life through us.
There is uh, this song that we used to sing, and I, I got the, uh, the lyrics to it, and it's about, the name of it is, You Are My King, Amazing Love. And verse 1 says, I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted because you were condemned. And uh, she's talking about Jesus. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. And the chorus is, amazing love, how can it be that you, my king, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. Like I said, we used to share the, we used to sing this song. And we had a guy that used to used to come here, and he got up and he shared one time, and he says, uh, "You know, uh, in the natural world, the king wants his men to go out and die for him. But in the kingdom of God, Jesus came." and died for his people. I was uh, I was visiting with a fellow that I knew. Well, I still know him. But uh, I don't know if it was last year or, or sometime, but uh, he, was, he was visiting from out of town. And he wasn't, he wasn't visiting me, but uh, I was called and told he was in town, so I, I went over and, and visited him while he was here. And uh, then I went on back home, and I was cutting grass. And, and while I was on the lawnmower, I just kept, kept thinking, you know, uh, about sharing some things with him. And... Uh, the, this guy and I have a lot in common. He's he's six months older than me, so we grew up listening to the same kind of music. And uh, he went to Vietnam. I went to Vietnam. Uh, we didn't know each other there. You know, we were in different parts and uh, different uh, jobs that we did. But uh, this this thing just uh, this little story kept going around in my mind, and I said, well. Uh, you know, I, I, I need to share it with him. But, uh, you know, it was several weeks before, and he'd already gone back home, but it was several weeks before I, I wrote it down. And uh, I, I kept putting off sending it to him. I, I still haven't sent it to him, but I'm, I'm going to. But I, I want to read that for you. And uh, I had planned to put it in the, uh, the, the newsletter, Faith Talk, in January, but I, I couldn't find it. I had it in this bag, and I cleared the bag out, and then I couldn't find it. So I said, well, I'll find it and put it in in the February issue. Well, I still couldn't find it. So, you know, I, uh, I started asking God. I said, well, God, where is it? And uh, I couldn't find it. I said, well, now, you know, you're no respecter of persons. You... When Pastor Bob and Susan asked you, you know, you just tell them right where it is. You know, you lead them right to it. Now, what, what's going on? Why, why, don't, why can't I find it? You know, so anyway, the February issue, the deadline came and, and went, so I couldn't put it in. And I wanted to share it tonight, and I couldn't find it. And so I started getting mad. I said, now, God, you know, this ain't right. So, you know, Linda, Linda prayed that I would find it. And I still didn't find it, you know. And I've experienced things that uh, I, I'm an electrician. And, you know, gold is a re very good conductor of electricity. So while I'm at work, I take my ring off and put it in. When I, when I, back then, I wore jeans, and it had a watch pocket. So I put it in my watch pocket. And one day it was almost time to come home, you know, from, from work. And I did something I'm not supposed to do. I took an air hose, and I was blowing the dust off of me, you know, and I, I blew it off of my clothes, and apparently I got it in that pocket just right, and that ring came out, and it was gone. So 
I didn't know it, but, you know, I got home, and I said, where's my ring? So I drove back to the mill, and I looked all around, looked everywhere I knew to look, and I couldn't find it for three days. I came over to the church and uh, asked Pastor Bob and Susan to pray for it, and they prayed. I still couldn't find it. Three days later, a fella came up and said, uh, we found this ring. Is it yours? Yeah, yeah, and I looked in it, it had my initials and all that. And uh, So I've had incidents where I've, you know, I've lost things and, and I've prayed about it and I found them. Well, one of, the, one of the times we went out of town, we left a key with my mother and she came over to the house to feed the cat and there was one of those skinks at the back door. Well, she threw the key away. Woo! We still have never found that key, and <laughs> don't know where it is. But point being, sometimes we don't know why, you know, when we lose something, like a job, we say, God, why? And I, you know, I, I got mad about that key a little bit, too. I said, you know, hey, you know, you're not a respecter of persons, but... I had to get over it. But after I, after I lost this, uh, this little story, I had the thought, I said, well, I'll just write it over. But it was a good while back when I, when I wrote it, and I, I didn't remember all that was in it. And I said, man, I'd hate to rewrite it and leave something out, you know. But... I went ahead and I wrote it, and I believe I have some things in there that weren't there before. And I won't know unless I find that other one and compare them. But sometimes when we ask God for things, he just He says no. Sometimes we lose things that God doesn't want us to have. Now, I'm not saying he didn't want me to have this story, but he and he didn't cause it to get lost, but for whatever reason, I misplaced it because I had it in, in that black bag that I, I bring to church. I had it in there for six months, and I know it was there because I look at it every once in a while. But uh, I said, well, I need to clean this stuff out, and uh, I don't know where I put it. But uh, I forgave God. <laughs> uh, you know, some people don't. I, I, you know, I make light of that, but, you know, some people have have things against God that, that they don't forgive. When I was six years old, my father died. Well, you know, I wasn't mad at God, but I had a brother that died when he was uh, 54 or 55 from colon cancer, and I, I really, to this day, I believe some of that was because he was mad at God. Now, right before he died, he, he got right with God, but he... You know, he resented God, and he did a lot of things that, that I don't believe he would have done had he been in a place where he wasn't holding a grudge against God. You know, and it doesn't have to be God. It can be anybody. Anybody you hold a grudge against, it just eats at you. It doesn't eat at that person. You know, even if that person is doing you unbearably wrong, it's to your benefit to forgive them. But I decided to sit down and, and go ahead and try to, to rewrite it. And I was just, I said, no, I, I know I'm not going to get it all, all in there, but I, I may have some things here that uh, it wasn't even in there before. So uh, let me read it. Let me read it for you. Uh, it's, the name of it is Commander-in-Chief. And... You know, if, if we call this a message and we put a name on it, I guess I would name it Commander-in-Chief, you know. But we're just talking, so you don't know what we're going to do with, with the results of this. But anyway, uh, a long time ago in a distant land, two soldiers were in a foxhole together. They were unaware that we're, they were fighting a war that they could not win on their own. Suddenly, they heard a noise in the distance. To their surprise, they spotted a bulletproof limousine approaching them. 
after the limousine pulled up, out stepped the commander-in-chief, surrounded by an entourage of Secret Service personnel. Amazingly, as the commander-in-chief joined him in the foxhole, he instructed the Secret Service men and the limousine to leave. The Secret Service men were caught off guard and didn't understand why such a command would be given, but they reluctantly obeyed. As the commander-in-chief spent time with the two soldiers in the foxhole, they were astonished how much like them he really was. After a while, one of the soldiers began to respect what the commander-in-chief had to say, while the other soldier rejected every word and even laughed at him. Seemingly without warning, the enemy launched a grenade into the foxhole. Before either of the two soldiers could react, the commander-in-chief threw his body on the grenade. The grenade went off and the commander-in-chief was killed. No man took his life, but he laid it down willingly. The two soldiers were terrified. The commander-in-chief had laid down his life for the one who believed and the one who did not believe. Some staff members came and got the body of the commander-in-chief and buried him. Three days later, he rose from the dead and now holds an even higher position of honor. This allegory may seem like a fairy tale, but it's based on a true story of actual events. The commander-in-chief is Jesus. In the beginning, Jesus was with God the Father, and Jesus was God. All things were created by him. Jesus is God in a human body. He stripped himself of his power as God and became like a man. He humbled himself as a servant even to the point of dying on the cross. No man took Jesus' life. He laid it down willingly. When God the Father raised Jesus from the dead, the, the Father seated him at, the, at his right hand in heavenly places and gave him a name far above every name. God said at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Unlike the commander-in-chief in our story, Jesus did not roll up in a bulletproof limousine or show up as king, even though he is a king and will return as one. But instead, he was born as a child in a stable to a young virgin who wrapped him in pieces of cloth and laid him in a feeding trough for animals called a manger because there was no room in the inn. Even though Jesus is actually a king, the first time he came, he came humbly on the colt of a donkey to provide salvation for mankind. When Jesus returns for a second time, he will be riding a white horse. He will return as judge, and he will wage war. The armies of heaven will return with him. On his robe and thigh is written, King of kings and Lord of lords. The Secret Service personnel are angels. Concerning angels, the Bible says, for he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up lest in their hands, lest you strike your foot against the stone. When Jesus was about to be arrested in the garden, one of his disciples drew a sword. Jesus told him to put it away. He told them, Don't you know I could ask the Father and he would send 12 legions of angels, which is 72,000 angels. The gospel was a, mirac the gospel was a mystery that even the angels did not know about. The, the enemy is the devil and one-third of the angels that were cast out of heaven. If the, de if the devil had known God's plan for man's salvation, he would have never crucified the Lord. The staff members who came and got the body of the commander-in-chief and buried him were a couple of the disciples. The war that the two soldiers were fighting is the hopeless attempt for man to provide for his own salvation by atoning for his own sin. 
Jesus was crucified on the cross. When Jesus was crucified on the cross, there, there, were, uh, there was a thief crucified on both sides of him. Eventually, one accepted Jesus as a Savior, and the other denied Jesus to the very end. The two soldiers in the foxholes are you and me. One represents the thief on the cross who accepted Jesus as a Savior, and the other represents the thief that rejected Jesus to the end. Which soldier are you? Armed with this information, armed with the information that your commander-in-chief willingly laid down his life in your place, what decision will you make concerning his offer for you to live with him forever? If you've never done it, simply bow your head, ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, and invite him, invite him to be your commander-in-chief. That's all I have. Thank you.